Okay. It says we're recording, so I'm going to take it that we are. Years ago, at a Southern Baptist Convention meeting, a, a fellow pastor, Frank Bushy, and myself were looking over uh, in the display area, and Rick Warren was sitting at a table, and he was actually uh, uh, autographing one of the books that uh, he had written, and uh, we went over there and, and started talking to him and told him about our work in Nevada and so forth. And, and in fact, uh, we talked about the possibility that someday he would uh, help sponsor work somewhere here in Nevada. And I'm, I'm thinking that one day he's going to do that. But it was really interesting. The three of us were there. And each of us had on Hawaiian shirts. And each of us were rather bulky. And so... Uh, I think Doris was there and she turned around and said, let me take your picture. And so the three of us looked like the three stooges uh, up there uh, taking this picture. Two unknown guys with uh, one of the most famous preachers in all of the world. And uh, we, we just had a great time uh, fellowshipping and talking. I have a quote that I want to read to you from Rick Warren. He said, 2,000 years ago, in the Middle East, an event occurred that permanently changed the world. Because of that event, history was split. Every time you write a date, you're using the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the focal point. A.D. Now, I know there's a Latin phrase for it, but it is after his death. It is a new day. A.D. A.D. That's where we live today. Gary Habermas is a man that has spent his whole life studying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he started out, he was a Ph.D. student at uh, the University of Michigan and uh, he was writing about the resurrection of Jesus. And he was not a Christian. He was as lost as a goose. And he was, uh, he was writing his PhD thesis in order to debunk, disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by the time he finished, he had given his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had been become convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ died on a cross and God raised him from the dead three days later. And uh, so I want to, to read what he says about most historians. He said, uh, there is a minimum of 10 historical facts that can be gleaned, which are being historical, uh, being uh, true by the majority of theologians today. And here they are. One, Jesus actually died on the cross. Two, he was buried in a tomb. Three, the disciples were extremely disillusioned and disconcerted by the death of Jesus being bereft of all hope. That same tomb in which Jesus was buried was found empty just a few days later, probably with the grave clothes still inside. The disciples were the recipient of several experiences which they believed were resurrection appearances of Jesus. Afterward, the disciples experienced a complete transformation, being willing to die for their new faith. The resultant preaching often took place in Jerusalem, the exact place where Jesus was killed and buried. This preaching led to the birth of the church, featuring Sunday as the most important day of worship instead of Saturday. Later, Paul was converted to Christianity by means of an experience which he also believed was an appearance of the risen Jesus. Those are historical facts that, that theologians, historians actually say these are true. These are true. So why, why is the resurrection 
of Jesus Christ so important? Well, the Apostle Paul, who Jesus appeared to on the Damascus Road when he was converted, he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse number 12. Paul says, and I quote, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he was raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Paul is saying, this resurrection is really important stuff. One of the very liberal theologians of the 20th century, Gunther Borgum, said this. Now notice what he says. There would be no gospel, not one account, no letter in the New Testament, no faith, no church, no worship, no prayer in Christendom to this day without the message of the resurrection of Christ. This resurrection is the central fact of Christianity. The cross and the resurrection are the most important aspects of our Christian faith. It separates us from all of the rest of the, quote, religions of the world because this is the occasion where God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It makes it completely different from every other religion in the world. Wilfar Pannenberg, one of the champions of the resurrection of Christ, said this, the resurrection of Jesus, the supreme act of God in history, can be proved by reason just as any other fact of history. Now, this is important. This is not some sweet dream. This is not something that we have latched onto with a hope that has no meaning. This is an absolute truth that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, we as Christians ought to be able to at least have a conversation with people when they say, I don't believe in the resurrection. Or what is this resurrection all about? And so I want to give you seven facts that you need to think about, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here are seven historical facts that prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an absolutely certain probability. Now, why do I say an absolutely certain probability? Because there is no way we can go back and reproduce what happened on that Easter Sunday. We can't reproduce it. And so we have to look at history and say, did it really happen? And these seven facts, I think, say, yes, yes, the resurrection actually happened. It took place. Now, the first thing I want you to see is the appearances of the risen Jesus to his followers. Now, we're going to, next week, we're going to go into these 12 appearances of Jesus Christ after he was raised from the dead, before he ascended back to heaven. And then we're also, if we have time, we're going to look at the five appearances of Jesus after he was raised from the dead, after he went back to heaven. 
This is this is historical facts. These are actual occurrences. And the, so, I mean, how can you refute these these times? This is the most important thing that we we can think about. The the resurrection appearances of Jesus. He appeared to over 500 people after he was raised from the dead. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the apostles. He appeared to his brother James, who was a non-believer. He thought Jesus was all a bunch of silliness whenever he was alive. But after he died and was resurrected, James became a believer and one of the great leaders of the church. He appeared to the two men on the Emmaus Road. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the other Marys. He appeared again and again. He appeared to Doubting Thomas, one of the disciples. Thomas said, well, I won't believe in him unless I see the nail prints in his hand and the spear wound in his side. And so Jesus came and said, look, feel. And Thomas, what did Thomas say? Oh, I'm convinced now. You know, what did he say? He said, my Lord and my God. Literally what he was saying, you, God, are alive. And I believe with all of my heart. So there were all of these appearances of Jesus after he was raised from the dead. They're documented. Now, the second thing is the complete change in the disciples. All 12 disciples abandoned Jesus before his crucifixion. All 12 of them. Of course, Judas, for sure. But all the other 11, they ran off too. Notice that uh, uh, Jesus even predicted that that was going to happen. In John chapter 16, Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Jesus, all the way back in, in uh, John 16, said, you're going to abandon me. And then in Matthew 26, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, uh, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. So Jesus prophesied that all of the disciples would abandon him, every one of them. And then they did exactly that, didn't they? In Matthew 27, at the time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Every single one of them. They abandoned Jesus. Now, here we have Right before the res or, uh, crucifixion, all the disciples <clears throat> took off and abandoned Jesus. Now, afterwards, they came back to Jesus, didn't they? We, we have read those scriptures. We, we know that they came back. And whenever you look at the history of these disciples. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a great book to read because it talks about all of the people that have given their lives for the sake of Christ. Every single one of the disciples, with the exception of the Apostle John, suffered a martyr's death. Every one of them. Now, tell me these stinking cowards that left Jesus before he was crucified, every one of them, after he was raised from the dead, came back and said, I'm willing to die to tell the truth about Jesus Christ. And they did. They died telling the gospel. Now, you tell me, isn't that dramatic proof that these men truly knew 
that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. All of the appearances, the disciples, the dramatic change in these disciples. And then the third thing is very simply the empty tomb. Did Jesus uh, come back from the dead? Yes. Why? Because there's nobody in his grave. Now, there have been people all through the centuries that have, have said, oh no, there, there's an explanation for this. There's a logical explanation. Jesus really didn't come back from the dead. There, there were people that said, you, you know the reason for the empty tomb? Whenever he died and they buried him in the tomb, his disciples came later that night. They snuck in and they stole his body. Now, you tell me, Roman soldiers that are guarding uh, a, a tomb and they were hoodwinked to believe that uh, these disciples could come in and steal the body of Jesus. It could never happen. Roman soldiers knew that if they let down on guard duty, you know what their, their fate would be? Execution. By crucifixion. So, the stolen body theory is absolute silliness. The swoon theory. The swoon theory says, well, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just swooned. And whenever they put him in the tomb, he uh, he came back to life. He, he, he came to. He came back to consciousness. Well, let me tell you, whenever Roman soldiers put somebody on a cross and crucified him, whenever they took that person off the cross, he was dead. They, they ran a spear through his body to make sure that he was dead. They knew that he was dead. He was a corpse on that cross, and they thrust the spear into him. He didn't move because he was dead. He was dead. The swoon theory is plain craziness. The hallucination theory. It says, well... The hallucination theory is that all of the disciples, all 11 of them, decided that uh, uh, they believed they had a vision that Jesus was resurrected. He really wasn't. All of them had the same hallucination at the same time. And psychologists, psychiatrists say this is a total impossibility. There is absolutely no way under the sun, that 12 people can have the same hallucination at the same time. Not even two people can have the same hallucination at the same time. And so this is silliness as well. The mistaken identity theory that indeed there was an imposter on the cross, that it wasn't Jesus who died on the cross, it was an imposter. <laughs> Somebody decided to... Uh, climb on the cross instead of Jesus, an imposter. That's plain silliness. And, and there are other people say, well, this is like one of the uh, uh, pagan myths. You know, there were pagan myths that said that uh, their, their hero or their god actually rose from the dead. A couple of them, uh, uh, Adonis and Osiris, both have uh, 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 narratives about how uh, Adon uh, Adonis and Osiris actually raised from the dead. Well, the problem is uh, uh, Adonis myth came, uh, was first established in 150 AD and the Osiris myth was 200 AD. I mean, this was 150 and 200 years after Jesus was raised from the dead that these guys came up. Uh, this is a copycat kind of situation. The wrong tomb theory is that uh, uh, the the people that uh, put Jesus in the tomb, they came back to, you know, uh, uh, further embalm him and do all the things they were going to do. And uh, they came to the wrong tomb. They didn't come, they didn't find the right tomb. Well, they didn't have GPS back then. So how could they really know? I mean, do you really think that that could actually be anything. There's a twin theory. You know, Thomas was called Didymus, remember? The twin. 
And so most Bible scholars say, well, he had a twin brother. And some actually say, well, you know who his twin brother was? It was Jesus. <laughs> well, how in the world could Thomas... Uh, be the twin, have died in place of Jesus, and yet he was alive whenever they uh, they came around and said, well, Jesus is alive. And Thomas said, well, I want, I want to see the nail prints. I want to see all this. A twin? There's nothing about a twin in the Bible. They talk about Jesus' brothers, and Thomas was not mentioned. Twin was not mentioned. Absolutely silly. There's the alien theory. This is my favorite one. The Eric Von Daniken uh, theory. You know, that, that guy that ha had all this stuff that said that uh, there were people from other planets that came here all through men's history. And, and that's why we, uh, uh, we've advanced like we have and so forth. And they said that Jesus was actually one of these aliens and uh, that that uh, uh, you know, as an alien, he he wasn't uh, uh, he didn't have to obey the the natural laws of this earth and so forth. And uh, so, if you believe that, then uh, I, I got a bridge I'll sell you too. So, and the contradictions theory, yeah, the the contradictions theory is really good. They say, well, you know, one account says that there were two angels at the the grave. And one account says there was one angel. And so they're, they're contradic contradictory evidence, so we can't believe the resurrection's true. <laughs> Give me a break, will you? I mean, there's, I, I, and these are just nine of the multitude of excuses and saying the reason for the empty tomb. You know what the real reason for the empty tomb is? Is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. The angelic witnesses. The, the angel said, you're looking for Jesus? He's not here. He has risen from the dead. You know, what you going to believe? You're going to believe me or believe an angel? <laughs> I, I would I would advise you to believe the angel. I could tell a lie. The angels don't lie. The grave clothes arrangement. It was just like there was a body in these grave clothes, and all of a sudden there was no body in these grave clothes, and they just collapsed like that. They, they weren't unwound or anything. It was just like the body came out miraculously out of these grave clothes. The soldiers guarding the tomb. You know, soldiers guarding a tomb, they, they are not going to allow themselves to be taken in by anything like this, are they? And they said, it's empty. We don't know how he got out. And so the Jews came up with all kinds of, of excuses and theories that they still talk about today. John R. W. Stott, a great uh, English uh, theologian, says, so the resurrection was neither a hallucination nor a resuscitation, but an objective supernatural event by which the process of decomposition was arrested and the dead body of Jesus was raised and changed. An empty tomb? Another proof that Jesus was raised from the dead. All of the people that saw him after he was resurrected, the change in the disciples was so absolutely dramatic that it changed the course of history the empty tomb. And the fourth thing, and this is this is kind of subtle, the attitude of the Jewish leaders in the book of Acts. If you want to just take some time and, and study something, look at the fourth and fifth chapters of Acts, where Peter and John and the other uh, apostles, they were doing things after the resurrection and after the ascension and, and uh, 
they were preaching about Christ and his resurrection. They got arrested and thrown in jail and, and all of it that went with it. And what did, the, what did the, the Jewish authorities say to Peter and John? They didn't say anything about spreading false rumors about the resurrection. What they said was, stop talking about the resurrection. They didn't ask them to stop making false accusations. They literally said, stop telling the truth about the resurrection because it's messing everything up for us. That's what it's all about. The Jewish leader, they didn't say, well, let's just go to the tomb and let me show you the body of Christ because they knew that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But they had their own agenda. They didn't want the whole world to follow after Jesus. They wanted to keep them for themselves. And then the fifth thing is the existence of the church. Do you realize that on the day of Pentecost, that the church was formed. You don't, you don't really know anything about the church until the day of Pentecost. And in one day, thousands of people were brought into the fellowship of the first Christian congregation. Today, well, actually, as of uh, 2022, the best information that I could find, the latest, 31.5% of the world's population is Christian. That means that there, as of 2022, 22 billion Christians in the world. Now, that's a figure that I can't even begin to understand. From that 120 people on the day of Pentecost that came together and the church was formed, today the church is 183,333,333 times the size it was on the day of Pentecost. Now that's a pretty good sized church, if you ask me. That, that's a pretty good church that size. By the second century AD, critics were saying that the evangelists read back into church history the importance of the resurrection. In other words, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written a generation after the apostle Paul wrote his first epistles. Those were the first uh, uh, letters that we have in the New Testament. And then it was a whole generation away. And so the church was actually formed by that time. And the church read back into history the resurrection. You say, well, how can that be? Well, you know, sometimes uh, we, we've seen revisionist history take place even in our generation, haven't we? And so that what they're saying is that actually the resurrection that we know today is revisionist history that happened whenever the, the gospels were written. And so this has been this has been a real source of contention in the the uh, study of the New Testament. Now, form criticism is a type of, of uh, study of the Bible. And it uh, attempts to trace uh, each type of literature all the way back from the written time when it was written, all the way back to the time when it was just an oral tradition. In other words, what they're saying is that what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote, they have to trace it all the way back to what was actually being said about the resurrection at the time the church was actually formed, when there wasn't any written record. Now, contrary to what you uh, may have expected is the origin of everything miraculous in the New Testament was the faith of the early church that uh, then a real part of Jesus' life. Scholars are 
uh, uh, cannot reach a, a form critical layer of tradition in which the resurrection belief is not present. All that gobbledygook is saying is this. You trace it all the way back from the time that the Gospels were written back to the, the time when the Gospels were being written all the way back to the time when there was just this word of mouth about them all the way back to the formation of the church on the day of Pentecost, and you'll find the resurrection was a part of the, the message of the church from the very, very, very beginning. There is no way around it. And that is one of the greatest proofs that scholars, they look at that and they can't refute it. They can't say that's, that's not true. And the other thing that you'll see is, is uh, Christian worship day is Sunday. And that's Sabbatarianism. You know what Sabbatarianism is? It's the view that one day a week is reserved for religious observance and worship. And it was required in the Old Testament laws about the Sabbath, that man is to abstain from labor except necessary for the welfare of family and, and uh, society. So number one, God commanded, he commands his people to observe the Sabbath. Look what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In, in it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. Doesn't say anything about the wife, though, does it? She's, she's she's definitely got to cook Sabbath yeah. dinner. In uh, six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Should Christians observe the Sabbath? Absolutely. Does that mean they should stop work on Saturday? No, it says that they should have one day a week that they reserve for a day of rest. Do you know that there's no place in the Old Testament, no place in the New Testament where God says you have to go to church on the Sabbath? It says you have to rest on the Sabbath. You have to rest on the Sabbath. That's what the Sabbath is all about. Now, the first century Jews, the Jews at the time of Jesus, attended the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And this happened because when they were in exile, when they were away from Palestine, when they were in Babylon and, and uh, Assyria and Persia, they, they, they came up with a situation. The temple wasn't there. So they, they formed little groups of people and they called them synagogues. And they got together and they studied the scriptures and they they worshiped together and they prayed together and so forth. And so it became a, a tradition that by the time of Jesus was very, very entrenched in Jewish society. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter four, it says this, and Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit. The news about him was spread throughout all the surrounding, di surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogue and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And so by the time of Jesus, it was kind of expected that you go to the, to the synagogue on the Sabbath because it was a time when you could worship God. Now, it still doesn't say you have to go and worship on the Sabbath. It was a custom that was arrived at by these Jews. And there's nothing wrong with that custom whatsoever. But recognize that uh, uh, these, uh, these people, they went to the, the synagogue on the Sabbath. And so whenever the church was formed on the day of Pentecost, who formed the church? It was Jews that had been converted to Christ. They were still Jews 
And so they still went to the synagogue on Saturday. So when could they get together with other Christians? They decided, well, let's get together on the first day of the week because it was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Acts chapter 20, verse tw uh, 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Thank God I'm not going to preach that long. Uh, second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collection will be made when I come. And so there were at least two things that were going on on the first day of the week. They come together and take an offering. They came together to break bread, in other words, to observe the Lord's Supper. This was a time when Christians got together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more, as you say, see the day drawing near. And so this first day of the week was a day of Christian worship. It changed radically the Jewish society. In fact, within months, Short years, it actually changed the complexion of the church because when Gentiles began to, to be saved, they had no need to go to the synagogue. But they wanted to gather together with fellow believers. And so Sunday became the day of worship. Sunday became that day. Now, it was a day that Christ was resurrected, and it was also the day of Pentecost when the church received the Holy Spirit. Because Pentecost was actually 50 days after the Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday. And so it was again on a Sunday. So Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. The Holy Spirit came to believers on Sunday. The last thing was the conversion of Paul. Saul, as he was known before his conversion, was either a member of the Sanhedrin or worked for the Sanhedrin, and he was one of the, the men that actually persecuted these brand new Christians. He hated these people because they were drawing people away from the Pharisaical beliefs uh, that he held so dear. And so here he is, and he is doing everything he can to, to keep uh, people away from Christianity. And so this is, this is so absolutely important. His conversion was a complete change. And his conversion led this, this scholar, this man that, that knew the Jewish law so absolutely excellently that he was able to become one of the chief spokesmen that God used to take the word uh, to, uh, to the world. And so uh, he was converted. He was changed. And his change was made a radical difference in the church. So those seven things, whenever, whenever you, you have people that say, I don't believe in the resurrection, it can't be true. <clears throat> it can be true. It is true. We can look at it. And so the resurrection is important. The resurrection theologically is one of the most important things that we do. So uh, the very last thing I want you to, to uh, remember here is in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. The Apostle Paul said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. Number two, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the resurrection is really a part of believing who Jesus is and what he did. 
you have to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. And there are people out there who says, well, I believe in Jesus. You know, he was a great example. Well, he was a great example, but that doesn't save you. You know what saves you? That Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. Plain and simple. You don't believe that. You don't believe in the Christ of salvation. So is it important? The resurrection? It's absolutely essential. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. You believe in the resurrection? You believe in Jesus the Savior. That's what it's all about. You believe in Jesus as the Savior. And so as we as we conclude this time together, let's sing a hymn. And let's sing because he lives, because that's what it's all about. That's our message. That's our message on Easter, because he lives. Would you join me as we sing that marvelous and wonderful?